ओम सराशव समारंभाम शंकराचार्य मध्यमाम अस्मराचार्य पर्यंधाम वंदे गुरु परम पराम ओम परमेश्वर प्लीज बी सीटेड Still in the meditation. <laughs> oh, nice! <laughs> nice to be in that groove. <clears throat> Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bhunaktu, Sahavidyan Karavavahai, Tejasvina Vadhi Tamas Tuma Vibhishavahai. Om Shanti 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 Very good. Welcome back. Welcome to all of the students attending these classes online. We continue our uh, study of Uddhava Gita. We missed last week. Uh, we had too much uh, snow. So we'll pick up the thread uh, thread today, where we ended the, can I have the slide please? Yes. Where we ended the last uh, class was um, with this wonderful verse where Sri Krishna introduced very powerful meditation technique, which means not an introductory technique, the kind of technique you arrive at after many years of practice, and that technique is described in the last two lines. We already saw this last week. So he says, uparameta, you should withdraw your mind, that mind which is virajam, that manas is in the next line, that mind which is pure, that mind which has been quieted, and what should you do with that mind? Mayi arpya. Arpya, you should literally offer, but it means to fix your mind. You should fix your mind where? Mayi, Sri Krishna says, on me. So this is a very, um, you know, to withdraw your mind from all worldly concerns and to focus your mind exclusively on and when he says, mayi, on me, Sri Krishna again and again says both in Bhagavad Gita and Uddhava Gita, he's referring to his presence in your own heart as the so-called inner divinity. In Vedantic language, your true nature as Satcharananda Atma, he says again and again. So, having said that to Uddhava, given him, giving Uddhava this, uh, this very heavy meditation practice, I wonder if Uddhava looked at Sri Krishna like this. <laughs> what, <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> how, how can I do that? Because what follows immediately is Sri Krishna saying, okay, if you can't do that. So it suggests that Uddhava might have said or done something to indicate to Sri Krishna that he's not quite ready for this heavy technique. And so now what we see is a series of verses on alternatives to meditation. First, he's going to talk about karma yoga. 
Then he's going to, Sri Krishna is going to talk about bhakti. And before we see those verses, let, let's just begin with this observation about one of the really unique features of the Hindu tradition in general. You've heard me talk about it before, this principle of adhikari bheda. Bheda, there's a difference among adhikaris, among the qualifications and orientations of spiritual seekers. We are not all the same. Most religious and spiritual traditions fall into a category that I've jokingly called one size fits all. If you think of other religious traditions, that's largely the case. But this is a unique, and I, I think underappreciated aspect of the Hindu tradition, that the Ved starting with the Vedic rishis, we are not all considered to be the same. Different teachings are presented for different people according to their temperament and where they are in their path of spiritual growth. We've had this discussion many times, so I won't go further on it here, but it's, I think it's helpful to point it out here before we go forward that this is an excellent example of Sri Krishna pointing to the importance and centrality of this uh, principle of adhikari bheda. So suppose Uddhava isn't ready for this meditation, then what? And that's what Sri Krishna says in the next verse. Yadyanisho dharayatum, yadyanisho dharayatum, mano brahmani nishchalam, mano brahmani nishchalam, mai sarvani karmani, mai sarvani karmani, nirapeksha samachara, Nirapeksha samachara. So, Sri Krishna begins, Yadi, if, if you are anishaha, not in control. Isha, the, the root ish is actually to control from which ishwara comes. So, anisha here is referring to one who is not in control, specifically one who is not in control of your mind. If you're not in control of your mind, how in the world are you going to fix your mind exclusively? And that's what he says. So suppose, yadi, suppose anishaha, suppose you are not in control and uh, anishaha dharayatum, you are not capable of dharayatum to control, to concentrate, to fix to fix your manaha, to fix your mind. Suppose you are not able to fix your mind, brahmani, interesting, um, prior verse he said mayi, on me. In this verse he says brahmani, on brahman. What does that suggest? Prior verse, fix your mind on me. This verse, fix your mind on brahman. You get it, right? Okay. So he says, suppose you are not able to fix your mind on Brahman Nishchalam, as in your mind being uh, unwavering. Suppose you cannot fix your mind steadily on Brahman, on me, then what should you do? Should you give up your spiritual practice and go to the local bar <laughs> and drink your, your worries away? I'm being quite silly, sorry. Then what should you do, Sri Krishna says in the second half, and see if this sounds familiar, sarvani karmani, all of your deeds, samachara at the end, all of your deeds you should dedicate mayi, back to mayi, <laughs> to me. 
You should dedicate all your deeds to me, you who are nir apekshaha, without desire. You should become, you should dedicate all your deeds to me, anapekshaha, without desire for the results. So this sounds like it could have been taken from the Bhagavad Gita. It's, we're right back to karma yoga. We're only going to see one verse on karma yoga here. But it's summarized so nicely. Samachara, you should dedicate sarvani karmani, all of your deeds, mayi, to me. And samachara, you should go and conduct your activities, nirapekshaha. And here's a place where both in Bhagavad Gita and Uddhava Gita, uh, this word gets mistranslated, nirapekshaha. If you find a translation, I bet it'll say without expectations. You should act without expecting results. How many times have you read that? Every time you read the, almost every translation. I, won't, I don't know if, I can't say almost every translation of Bhagavad Gita because I've not read every translation of Bhagavad Gita, but a common, common mistranslation of words like anapeksha without apeksha literally means without expectation, but look at the problem in translation. If you say you should act without expecting results, we've had this discussion before, right? If your, if your car if you know your car has a dead battery, then to act without results, I'm sorry, to act without expecting results would mean to sit in your car and turn the key because you don't expect it to start. Who would do that? If you know <laughs> you're not, your car isn't going to, you, you act because you do expect results that's normal human behavior. So the problem here with is one of translation. This idea of acting without expecting results is a mistranslation of acting without desiring the results. Big difference, right? Expecting results is normal. Desiring the results is a problem. Raga dvesha. You want it which means if you can't get it, there's a huge problem. So we won't, you know, there's a huge, huge uh, teaching that goes along with karma yoga. We won't go back through all of that right now. But here, with this principle of adhikari bheda in mind, Sri Krishna says, if you can't meditate, then what? Practice karma yoga. By the way, in a couple of verses, he's going to say that after you've practiced karma yoga for a while, you're probably ready for this meditation because karma yoga is preparatory, as is uh, the practice of bhakti, which is what he turns to next. So alternative, if you can't meditate, alternative one, practice karma yoga. Alternative two, practice bhakti. Of course, if you really understand karma yoga and bhakti, you know they're one and the same thing. The only difference is bhakti perhaps is when you're sitting in front of an altar and uh, karma yoga is when you're sitting at your desk. <laughs> same. When you're sitting at the altar, you're in Ishwara's divine presence. When you're sitting at your desk at work, have you escaped somehow <laughs> Ishwara's <laughs> divine presence? You haven't escaped it, but you may not be thinking about it. So karma yoga could be, there are many ways of, I'm sorry, many ways of defining karma yoga. One way is to take that bhava you might have sitting in front of the altar and cultivate that same bhava when you're sitting at your desk. That's it. It's a matter of maintaining that bhava. Of course, there is so much to talk about uh, in karma yoga, but this isn't the right 
right uh, place for it. So let us continue. So after giving karma yoga as an option, why is this not? There it, oh, and I'm going backwards again. I keep doing that. And now it's not working. Uh, oh. Huh. There are three buttons on this. You'd think I'd figure out by now how to use it. <laughs> anyway, so there we go. All I have to do is push the right button. All right. Shraddhalur me katha shrinvan. Shraddhalur me katha shrinvan. Subhadra loka pavanihi. Subhadra loka pavanihi. Gayan hanusmaran karma. Gayan hanusmaran karma. Janma chabhi nayan muhuhu. Janma chabhi nayan muhuhu. So now turning from karma yoga to bhakti, which isn't much of a turn. He says, um, shrinvan, listening. Listening to what? Me kataha, stories about me. Stories about me, which are subhadra, which are very blessed, very holy. Stories which are loka, Pavanihi, purifying for all people. So listening to the holy stories, of course, the Bhagavata Purana, from which the Uddhava Gita is, a, is excerpted, that Bhagavata Purana is just filled with all of these amazing stories of his childhood, of his uh, teenage years, up until the time he goes to uh, um, uh, the... Uh, uh, Kurukshetra, the scene of the Mahabharata war. So all the earlier stories, yeah, all the earlier stories are found in the same Bhagavata Purana from which our Uddhava Gita is taken. So he says, listening to all those wonderful stories and listening how Shraddhaluhu, one who has Shraddha, Little, little tricky. Um, allow me to share some personal observations about the, these stories. Shraddhaluhu means you have to have faith. You have to believe in those stories. So when, you know, decades ago, when I started reading uh, Bhagavata Purana stories, I came across these stories of Sri Krishna doing all these amazing things, story after story. And uh, you know, just to give as an example, as a baby, he takes a handful of dirt, puts it in his mouth. Mother freaks out. Mothers are always like that. <laughs> and wants to get the dirt out of his mouth. So she <laughs> kind of for forces his mouth open, and mother sees in that mouth the entire cosmos. What a story. So she looks into baby Krishna's mouth and sees the entire cosmos. She showed it us. When I read these stories for the first time, remember, raised in Western culture, <laughs> Now, those of you raised in, in India, having heard these stories from childhood onwards, consider the fact that you're going to have a very different relationship with those stories than I, the Deshi, <laughs> the foreigner. <laughs> and initially, I really struggled. And here was a struggle. Can I commit myself to a tradition of Advaita Vedanta that is associated with stories which are so fantastical as to see the entire universe in his little baby's mouth? 
is this suitable for me? Is a question I entertained this was decades ago, long ago. And it was necessary for me to resolve it. It might not be, those of you raised in India, might not be necessary, or it might be. So how did I resolve that? So these are stories. Stories found in the Bhagavata Purana are not accurate records of historical events. Allow me to say that again. The stories we read in the Bhagavata Purana and elsewhere need not, I'll, I'll paraphrase, or I'll add a little bit here, those stories need not be understood as accurate accounts of historical events. Meaning, if you want to, why not? There's absolutely no harm, and even, I would argue, there's some benefit. If you have enough shraddha, enough faith, enough belief, to accept those stories at face value as accurate accounts of historic events, if you can do that, good, helpful. But this is a, an interesting example of living in modern society and being well-educated leads us not to have that kind of shraddha. In ancient times, it was assumed. Everyone accepted these stories without question. Nowadays, in our very modern scientific culture, it becomes more difficult to accept those stories on face value. So here's, here's my personal observation. Those who can accept those stories on face value without questioning, in a, in a way they are blessed to have such simple hearts, such simple minds, that they can just accept without questioning. But suppose you're not born with that kind of simple mind. Suppose you're not born with that kind of unquestioning faith. Then it's okay. It just means it's a little harder, <laughs> which it was for me. So I had to resolve this and understand that these are not historical events, but they are highly symbolic stories to teach spiritual truths. And the spiritual truth, look at that story. How silly it is on face value, how profound it is. When you get the Vedantic perspective on that story, the entire cosmos is in Sri Krishna. Well, yeah. <laughs> Very profound symbolism. So whether or not you accept the historicity of these stories, the, the, um, the value of those stories remain. And I, I'm, I guess I'm making a point because every time I make comments like this, that the stories are not historical val valid, you can be sure this, this class will be posted on, on my uh, uh, YouTube channel. You can be sure in the comments some, some people are going to say, Swamiji, how can you say that those aren't historically true events? <laughs> Watch. <laughs> those, those comments will come. They, all, they always do. And it's okay. Now, I respect people who have that perspective, and that's why I try to soften my language as much as possible by saying, if you accept those stories at face value, it's wonderful. But... I don't, and I think a great number of people don't anymore because we live in this increasingly modern scientific world. Fortunately, you need not accept these stories as historical truth, but they're still valuable. So if you have this childlike simplicity, as I said, there's an advantage with regard to bhakti. If you don't, 
person, you just have to work at it harder, is the idea. This idea of cultivating bhakti. One more comment before we continue, and that is, you've probably known very simple, childlike people, not childish, childlike people, pure-hearted, who are able to read these stories and accept it all. Have you seen how, how deeply devoted such people can be? I think it's a real blessing. And it's a blessing, however, that eludes me and may elude some or many of you. And all it means is it's one more obstacle to overcome on our spiritual path. He talking, he's talking about shraddhaluhu, that one with that very simple, open, childlike, accepting mind. So that shraddhalu, that per, what, shraddhalu, by the way, one who has shraddha is shraddhalu. So that, that, that faithful person has a blessing which is helpful. That's what Sri Krishna is mentioning here. And if you find that you don't have that degree of shraddha, it simply means you have to work a little harder to develop that bhakti. And it, it worked for me. I had to work harder, <laughs> but that bhakti gets developed. Okay, so he gives the first, first of several uh, instructions here. So first is, is Shrinvan listening to these wonderful stories of me. Not only listening, but Gayan, singing. Singing about what? Karma, uh, karma, Janma. You have to, there was that may in the first line. You have to connect all these words. Singing about my Janma and my birth. How many bhajans are there? that talk about Sri Krishna, his birth, his stories of his childhood. Wonderful bhajan. So go on singing them. Anusmaran, go on, uh, remember them, reflect on them, think about them, meditate on them. And in the last line, cha, abhinayan, muhuhu. Abhi, there are two ways of taking this. Abhinayan, most common meaning would be acting them out. Abhinaya, acting, most of you know. So, uh, and this continues to be a tradition in India even today. It's even in these remote villages, they'll have act, Ramayana will be reenacted, the stories of Sri Krishna will be reenacted. So, wonderful spiritual practice, acting. Actually, there's a, a Western scholar did a study, I think it was his PhD thesis in religious studies. He studied the, these, uh, these um, reenactments of uh, the life of Rama and Krishna and all of this. And he, his thesis, I think, was published as a book with the title, Acting as a Means to Salvation. What an interesting title. <laughs> Acting as a Means to Salvation. This is Western scholarship Western analysis of this play, participating in these dramas as a spiritual practice. Some of, I know some of you did this as children, in, uh, perhaps in your schools. You know, very nice. Okay, um, before we go on, look at this. We have, we have Shrinvan listening to those stories, Gayan uh, singing those stories, Anusmaran, remembering those stories, and this Abhinayan can be understood in a second way, and that is the obvious way, of course, is acting, being in these dramas. But abhi, the root meaning is actually to go near. There's a root meaning of this word. And the reason that's significant is what Sri Krishna is doing here is quoting from a list of nine bhakti practices. Navavidha bhakti. Many of you have heard this expression. Navavidha bhakti means nine types 
of devotional practice. I'll just read them out for you. I don't want to make a big deal of this, but it's interesting to see the connection. So uh, the Navavidha Bhakti includes Shravana, Shrinvan, then Kirtana, Gayan, <laughs> then Smarana, Anusmaran, then Parasevana, pa a service to the feet, going near, Abhinayan. And in the next verse, uh, you have Archana is the next of the Navavidha Bhakti. We'll see that in the next verse. And just to finish it, that's all he quotes, but just to finish up the Navavidha Bhakti, the remainders are Vandana, um, worshipping, bowing, Dasya, an attitude of service, Sakya, an attitude of friendship, and finally, Atma Nivedana, dedicating yourself. So this Navavidha Bhakti, if you haven't heard of it before, just ignore it, <laughs> what I'm saying right now. Some of you, though, have been exposed to this particular wonderful devotional teaching. I think it's based on Bhagavata Purana. There's nine forms of, of worship. So Sri Krishna here very specifically refers to this Navavidha Bhakti. And then he concludes in the next going backwards again. He concludes in the next line. Mararte dharma kamartan Mararte dharma kamartan Acharan marapashraya Acharan marapashraya Labate nishchalam bhaktim Labate nishchalam bhaktim Mayud Tavasan, my yudhavasanatane, my yudhavasanatane. So the sentence continues. So he's giving all of these approaches to devotion. By the way, another example of our of our um, adhikara beda, right? There's not one way to worship God. There's not one form of God that is to be worshipped. So again, just highlighting this uh, unique uh, uniqueness of the Hindu tradition, Vedic tradition. So he gives other options here. He says, um, Mararte Dharma Kama Artan Acharan Acharan Doing, pursuing, pursuing what? Dharma, Artha and kama, three of the four purushartas, dharma, worshipful activities, kama, pleasurable activities, artha, uh, profitable activities. So he says, pursuing all of these, mararte, for my sake. For my sake, this goes, actually this is back to karma yoga. We won't go into a lot of detail, but you might remember in our prior discussions of karma yoga, and that is to follow dharma meticulously is to devote your actions to Ishvara. Let me say that again and explain it just a moment. It's a little bit unconventional. To follow dharma meticulously is to devote your actions to Ishvara. Following laws meticulously is something, I don't know about you, I'm not very good at <laughs> doing. You know, I tend to do what's, what's convenient, but dharma, dharma I follow. <laughs> when I say laws, I'm talking about conve conventions. To follow dharma meticulously means to follow that principle of ahimsa meticulously. While you're engaged in dharma, acts of worship, while you're in day engaged in kama, enjoying pleasures, when you're engaged in artha, pursuing wealth, while you're engaged in all of those, to follow dharma meticulously, 
means to avoid harm in any situation whatsoever. This is Madarte karma. This is karma dedicated to Ishvara because there are several, again, we can talk about this the rest of uh, the day very briefly. Sri Krishna dwells in every person. So then, whatever you do should be to avoid injury to every person. This is the idea. And this is one of many, many aspects of, of karma yoga. By the way, if, if you're not... Uh, I, many of you attended the classes on Bhagavad Gita where we discuss karma yoga in tremendous detail. If you missed those classes, there's one video on my uh, channel on karma, a fairly recent video, that's like a shortcut. So go look at that video. All right, let's see the title of it. I don't even remember. Anyway, just if you look up on my, my uh, uh, channel about one year ago approximately, less than a year ago, a video on karma that will summarize a lot of what I've just referred to. Finally, Sri Krishna says, to practice bhakti, what should you do? Mad, a, mad apashrayaha. You should... Your ashraya, apashraya, should be mud, me. You should find refuge in me, which means your orientation in life should be towards spiritual growth and not towards other activities. What, what is, what is your, interesting, put it in these terms, what is your source of comfort? For some people, there's a comfort food. Some of you have comfort food, so that's comfort. Some of you like watching old Hindi movies, whatever it is. Okay, that's more comfort. Where do you go for comfort? None of you, but some people, I, I joked before, some people go to the local bar, tavern, for comfort, liquid comfort. Not advisable. <laughs> But the point is, is that there are many sources of comfort out there. Suppose you understand that the ultimate source of comfort is here, Sri Krishna's presence within you. That's what he refers to, madapashraya. So such a person, labhate, gains. Gains what? Nishchalam bhaktim, unwavering devotion. Such a person gains unwavering devotion, mayi, unto me. Unto me, sanatane, unto me, the eternal one, uddhava, o uddhava, by engaging in these practices. He gave five out of the nine different uh, practices in this Navavidha bhakti. By engaging in these various devotional practices, one lavate gains nishchalam bhakti, this unwavering devotion. Okay, we'll see the, this is the last verse before uh, Uddhava asks a question, so let us see that right now. Shri, in fact, Sri Krishna now concludes this line of thought with this verse. Satsangalabdhaya bhaktya, Satsangalabdhaya bhaktya, Mai maam yahu pasita, Mai maam yahu pasita, Savai me darshitam sadbhir, Savai me darshitam sadbhir, Anjasa vindate param, Anjasa vindate param. So, how can you gain this nishchalam bhaktim? And he gives some. This is surprising. It's one, it's the most obvious and most overlooked <laughs> practice. He says that this, he says, bhaktiya, through this bhakti, which is labdhaya, which is gained, through this bhakti which is gained, how? 
satsanga labda, through this bhakti which is cultivated through satsanga. Satsanga means what? Sangha, association. And usually the sat usually gets translated as sadhu. So sadhu, sangha, association with good people. Sadhu doesn't only mean sannyasis. Any good person is a sadhu. Through satsanga, through association with good people, one cultivates bhakti and much more. Reflect on this, if, if, you, if you would. Satsanga ev is, everyone takes it for granted. So many people, you, know, you come here on Saturday mornings and some people will say, yes, I go for satsanga at uh, Swamiji's ashram. So that word satsanga is used even for classes like this because you're in association. If you look around you, I don't see any, any axe murderers <laughs> in the room. <laughs> You know, so here we are in the association of good people, sadhu sangha. And through the scriptures and through the teacher, we're in association with so much more. So this is sadhu sangha, association with good people, which is the most... The, those of you who know me, you know I'm careful when I use absolute expressions because it's so easy to say the only way, the best way. And usually when somebody says the only way, it's not the only way. When somebody <laughs> says it's the best way, it's not the best way. It's one of many. But So I, I, I do this rarely. The best spiritual practice. There's a best. Spiritual is one of the few times you can say there's a best. What is the best spiritual practice? What we're doing right now, satsanga. Uh, and not only classes, but any kind of association with good people, with people on a spiritual path. It's just so obvious. You know how much the people we associate with affect us, especially when we're young. Think about that. Now, you know, now that we're a little older, our personalities are a little better formed, but when we're young, we're sponges. Whatever environment we're in, we just soak it up. If you're in a good environment, how wonderful to just soak that up. What about those who aren't in a good environment? environment. The opposite of satsanga is dusanga. <laughs> to be in association with the good people and the not so good people. So if you're in association with those people and if you soak it up like a sponge, <sighs> problem, right? So this is just an opportunity to observe that satsanga doesn't mean only classes, but in the largest sense, it is associating with people on a spiritual path. And the reason that is the, the reason I can get away with calling it the best spiritual practice is satsanga will lead to all other spiritual practices. Because your sangha, your, your association with sadhu, with good people, some of the good people practice bhakti, some of the good people practice karma yoga, some of those good people practice meditation, some of those good people pursue jnana, spiritual wisdom. So through satsanga, all of those spiritual practices become accessible to you. Without satsanga, what access to spiritual practice do you have? Think about it. At best, well, you could say at best picking up a book, but you could argue that picking up a book is satsanga with the author, right? 
<laughs> it's a kind of satsanga. So in the complete absence of satsanga, in the complete absence of any interaction with people on a spiritual path, how can you follow that spiritual path? How can you progress? Anyway, you get my point. Satsanga is taken for granted. Everyone just assumes it. But it could truly be called the most important spiritual practice because it leads to all other spiritual practices. Okay, let's, let's finish this up. So this bhakti, which is labdha gained through satsanga, sadhu sangha, association, association with good people. So that, so th that uh, due to that bhakti, second line, yaha, one who upasita, one who meditates, one who meditates mom on me, one who meditates on me, uh, that mai goes to the first line. So, uh, uh, due to bhakti mai on me, due to devotion to me, gained through satsanga, yaha upasita, one who meditates mam on me, saha, that person, second, last line, vindate, that person gains me padam. We have to jump around a little bit. That person gains me padam, my, usually translated my state. Of course, pada, in the most literal sense, <laughs> is feet, foot. So that person attains my feet, which is a very beautiful devotional expression. Through satsanga, you are led, you can take it literally, you are led to the feet of the Lord. Take it figuratively, you are led to the state of divinity, the state of Ishvara. And you are led to that state which is darshitam, which has been told, stated, it's been taught, been taught by whom? Sadvihi. There's that sad again. Same sad as in satsanga is the same sad here in sadbihi. By those sadhus, by those good people. The same state which is described by these sadhus, by these good people, by these spiritual aspirants, that same state, that very state, may padam, my state, vindate, one can gain. And I'm smiling now because there's a... There's a in advertising, you always need to include some encouragement to buy the product. This is encouragement. And you'll never see a commercial for, for a product and it says, our product works. <laughs> never. <laughs> our product is the best. Our product makes all the other products look like trash. <laughs> so this is a, and this is actually a, you know, in, in, in scriptural study. You know, they, they call this duty, they call this praise, um, and it's important. It, and the reason it's important is being connected to these spiritual teachings is not a purely intellectual activity. We're driven, in fact, in all areas of life. No one is driven purely by the intellect, no matter how intellectual you may consider yourself. We, f we go in a direction that we feel led to go in. And what leads us is what we find valuable. All of this is to explain one word of stuti, one word of praise, and that word is anjasa vindate. One quickly reaches this state of divinity. How? Through satsanga. 
through bhakti, which is cultivated with the help of satsanga, one anjasa quickly reaches that state. So this word anjasa is added, need not be here. The meaning is perfectly clear without the word anjasa. Why is it added quickly? It means this is something pretty effective. And it is absolutely effective. The value of satsanga cannot be understated. And again, satsanga means, satsanga includes this kind of formal class, but satsanga includes so many other activities. Any activity where you are personally connected to any activity where you are personally connected to sadhu, a good person, a spiritual seeker. So think about how you spend your time, how you spend your days. The more time you spend, actually maybe a few of you commute to New York, so the more time you spend in the financial district, <laughs> That has an effect. Absolutely. Who can deny that? So it means that that effect has to be counteracted by satsanga. So to continue with classes, with satsanga, with uh, if you like to go to the temple, sing bhajans, Sri Krishna has given so many options here. And I mentioned books before. To read a, by the way, be, be highly <laughs> selective in the spiritual books that you choose to consume, but that's satsanga with the author. So if the author is someone you would like to, the American expression, hang out with, that's a book for you. So to go on reading. Anyway, this is a good place to stop. When we meet next time, we have Uddhava's question about satsanga, association with sadhus. Who exactly are those sadhus? And that's going to be uh, Uddhava's question. We'll see next week. Um, uh, schedule announcements. This evening we have our Samashraya support group. It's a support group for caregivers of those struggling with mental illness. So if that is uh, relevant for you, if you are a care, such a caregiver, that uh, support group will meet today at 4 o'clock here in this hall. Then tomorrow, Sunday, as always, we have our Vedanta class, the brilliant work of Shankaracharya at 10 o'clock, and it's followed at 11 o'clock by Satsanga. It's been quite lively lately, so it's nice. So please come and join us for any of those programs, and we'll conclude with our prayers at the altar. Om Ganana Hantwa Ganapati Gamavamahe Kavin Kavina Upamashravastamam Jaysta Rajam Brahmanam Brahmanas Patahana Shranvan Utibesira Sadanam Om Maha Ganapatahe Namaha Ishvaro Guru Hatmeti Murti Bhairavi Bhagine Vyoma Vad Vyapta Dehaya Dakshina Murtaye Namaha Vasudeva Sutam Devam Kamsa Chanura Mardanam Devaki Paramhanandam Krishnam Vande Jagat Guru 
Om Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha Sarve Santu Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Ma Kashchadukha Bhagavata Asatoma Sadgamaya Tamasoma Jyotirgamaya Mrityor Ma Amratangamaya Om Shanti 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 Om Tatsat.